What's good with the YouTube or comics perspective? It's your boy, Big Glocko. Smashing, dashing, sliding on through with a little bit of energy, man. And as you can tell by the thumbnail, we're going to get straight to it, man, YouTube. We're going to talk about the Nuestra Familia, Aryan Brotherhood, conflict of war, the casualties that have occurred, as well as a couple familiar names that you guys may know that you guys have read about in the past or heard their stories. Yeah, no doubt, man. As you guys, most of you know, man, you know, the, it was the, the MA was there. NF started, BGF and AB come into play. Everybody was kind of independent for quite some time. Little alliances started to form, you know, with the main one being the MA and the AB, NF and the BGF. Some of the, the main thing that cemented that alliance, man, was a particular hit. I guess uh, some leaders of the AB and some of the guys in the, the MA were on cordial terms and uh, decided that they would do better as one group functioning toward the same direction than as both would independently. And the way they cemented that was in 1972, April 21st, when Fred Mendrin, now listen to this name because it comes into play later on, was uh, the main person who killed Fred Charlie Castillo from Stockton. And this had been in Chino, Paul Mall. And Donald Held as well, bro. Yes, sir. Pay attention to them names. There's a reason for them, especially that second one Flacco said. Now, that's what uh, that's what cemented the alliance between the AB and the Mexican Mafia. And, and Rojo, a lot of that had to do, Joe Morgan, they said, is the one that kind of sealed that pack. You know what I mean? That when this occurred around 1972. Yeah. So what for the viewers out there, before this all was occurring, you know, the NF... In AB's interactions, it was not they were not involved in the war at that time. Right. There had been issues and skirmishes between the AB and the NF, but there was no seal pack agreement that had occurred between the AB and MA. They had a strong working relationship for years previously, right? The MA and the AB. Yeah. And as this issue, these that main issue, all these main issues we're going to be discussing right now is what pulled the NF closer to having a worker working relationship with the Black Rilla family. It was exactly. all, all focal point of your enemy's my enemy. Yeah. They went from there. Some other key things that contributed, at least as far as, you know, strictly, you know, on topic with the Aryan Brotherhood and the NF. In uh, August of 72, an individual by the name of Bruce Weddle Morgan was hit by the AB that, that, that Flacco just mentioned, Stephen Hadley. Hadley. And uh, the, the individual was uh, Daniel Cavanaugh was another one that was involved in that as well. And uh, yeah, Bruce Weddle Morgan, he got he got killed that day in 72, man. And, that and that's, an that's, an original, that's an original first generation NF member, Malcolm Clanton. No doubt. Furthermore, in July, also in July of 72, Jesse Bozo Renteria Castro, who was a, a familiano out of Orange County, actually, he was killed by the AB as well. You know, and there's other people, man, the Arana brothers, you know, a, a few people to mention, man. But um, what sets this thing different from other things, man, is, uh, you know, one of one of the people we've had on here before in uh, the legendary Fig as well, actually participated in, in this in this conflict to a, to a high degree. And uh, I'll explain a little bit of this in part of a parole recommendation hearing that I got. It's a statement of facts for FIG, Felix Avlios, who was an inmate at dual correctional, dual vocational institution for vehicle theft for a term of six months to five years. On December 20th of 1972, remember these names, Mr. Avlios and Glenn Holden, AKA Hobo, stabbed fellow inmate Stephen Hadley 14 times with a steel rod, as well as a weapon made of a piece of flat steel with a tape handle. The assault on Mr. Hadley was a gang reprisal by the Nuestra Familia prison gang against the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. After his conviction for the murder of Mr. Hadley, Mr. Avalos continued his involvement in the Nuestra Familia prison gang and became a high ranking member. Now, we haven't talked about Fig that much. You know, he, he made it home. You know what I mean? He's doing great out there and all this, as well as Mr. Holden. You know what I mean? They've changed their lives around. They're doing positive things. At one time, man, these gentlemen were with the business. 
You know, there's no and what's, doubt about what's, it. what's very instrumental about this time period, 1972, okay, like Rojo said, they had two, AB had killed two NF members at that time, one in the county jail, one at Chino State Prison. They also hit a long, a long time, first, first, first generation NF member, Bruce Weddle Morgan. At that time, there was a whole lot of killings going on, Bullwinkle, Diamond, the Aranda brothers just got hit by the MA at that time. And so that in the same week process, they hit Cheyenne, they took out Cheyenne, as we know, December of 1972. They also had their first AB killing, killing this individual, Steve Hadley. December what? What day was it? 22nd? I believe so, yeah. December 22nd, 1972. So within one within a within a one week process of both these hits happening, man, the NF basically stood their ground, ground and declared war on both these organizations. And so part of the reason why, and it goes back, you read it in, in the, the uh, last general standing in Fig's book, is because of the hit that this individual was involved in over there, over there in Chino State Prison when they hit uh, Wendell Morgan. And so part of the, the funny thing about this whole case was is in order for them to get the pieces out there to hit this guy, they had to have an individual named Chino from Stockton, who was a porter in that area where they did the hit. He was able to get the, at that time, he wasn't associated with the NF. He was able to get those pieces out there at that time, right? This same Chino, this is what people don't know. And there's a couple of people out there that know, right? Years later in Tehachapi Prison, he hit Quete, believe it or not. On the yard, Corny was there. Um, Pontiac was there from Modesto. Uh, a couple of people you know from Dakota were there as well, man. I mean, those are all factual situations, man. But let's go back to this incident, man. So, you know, this is a big deal, man. Like, Fig was definitely a factor. Hope was definitely a factor, man. They're doing great things, man. But this hit was kind of a, a, a along with a Cheyenne hit, brought breath and motivation back into the organization. Because up until that time, the NF and every institution, they were getting the bat end of the stick. They were getting hit up in Susanville, Tehachapi, Chino State Prison. And around this same time, I think there was only maybe one NF hit, which was uh, Daniel Loza, uh, 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 Chicken Legs from Chino. He, he actually hit um, and, and, and Bobby Zapata from uh, Big Bassett, who was a Mexican Mafia member. Now you're gonna have a lot of people say, oh, you know what? He wasn't recruited into the NF at that time. He became NF afterwards or in this and that, man. Whatever the, whatever the purpose is, I've talked to, to two or three people who were active NF members at that time who take claim that was the NF hit. I don't really care if it was or wasn't, but these are issues that did happen around this same time period. So there was a lot of things going on with the NF, the MA and the AB at that time. And for a minute, like I've talked to an NF member that was pulled around 1970. And he said that the Cheyenne hit, in addition to the, the Haley hit, brought back the morale of the organization. It brought back that energy because for a minute, man, they were just getting hit left and right at different prisons. And this is when the NF started to take that strong stance from around 72 to 78. We know the NF was at, at one of its most treacherous moments within the organization and how they were able to grow. And this is where the changes happened, where they voted Bob Wynn to be the, you know, the new astro general and they, and they started making new implementations they put the constitution into effect so all these things within the nf really started going to this direction around this time period and another thing too man that, that's, that's often overlooked man is like you know there'll be discussions about who was the baddest you know hitter in the nf who had the most whatever whatever and rarely do people remember to bring up fig man and you know not only with this man but fig was convicted of three other murders besides that one. Convicted. You know, Randy Rock, Robert Consul, Daniel Melendez. And the dude, Mr. Roth was was ordered June 8th of 74, orders from the gang, because he was a rival gang member. Last name of Roth. You know, um, he, he's overlooked his importance, man. A lot of people, it's not a name that comes up a lot, but man, that dude did a lot of work for the group, man, over the years. And there's no doubt about it. You know, and it mentions that in this parole hearing, man, he was granted parole at this time and it was overturned by the governor. You know, it says the, the, the governor's thing is the question I have must answer is whether Mr. Ablios will pose a current danger to the public if released from prison. The circumstances of the crime can provide evidence of current dangerousness while the record also established that something in the inmates pre or post incarceration history 
or the inmate's current demeanor and mental state indicate that the circumstances of the crime remain probative of cause, probative of current dangerousness. The board of, the board of parole hearings found him suitable for parole based on his status as no longer being involved in the gang efforts to program eight disciplinary three years, remorse, completion of vocational training, as well as age. And this is the governor saying, I acknowledge Mr. Avlios has made some effort to improve himself while incarcerated. He dropped out of the Western Familiar Prison Gang during the GED, has not been disciplined for institutional misconduct since 04, attended AA, Anger Management Parity Program, Category 5 Program, Creative Conflict Resolution. And he commended Mr. Avlios for taking these positive steps, but they are outweighed by the negative factors the demonstrator remains unsuitable for parole, saying his crimes were disturbing and senseless. He brutally stabbed another inmate to death on more than one occasion and was closely tied to the highest levels of the prison gang. He contributed ex escalating to escalating gang rivalry and violence within the prisons and was instrumental in the deaths of at least four people to further the criminal objectives. You know, so it goes on, it goes on and on to say, you know, that the bad outweighs the good, man. And, you know, basically to finish it off, he says, I'm troubled by his attitude about the murders of Roth, Consul, Melendez, and others. He displays little remorse or empathy for his crimes. Despite his convictions for first-degree murder for each of these men, he claims he was not personally responsible. And, you know, the, in, in his conclusion, he says, I've considered the evidence on the record that is relevant to whether he is dangerous currently. What I consider as a whole, I find the evidence I have discussed shows why he is currently poses a danger to society for release. Therefore, I reversed the decision to parole. You know, now don't get me wrong, he eventually got out, you know, just a few years later. But uh, man, he served a long time. And man, when you think of soldados, guerreros, you know, that, that put in work and made that ultimate sacrifice, them names and numbers, it speaks for itself, man, that he has to be mentioned up there with, with some of the most dangerous individuals ever. To, to, and they're, and, to and they're, both two, they're both two of the most humble people, man. Yeah. Today, you man, like never know. Gotta, we, had, we had we had one of them on here, man. Great dude. You would never guess. You would think he was just a and, and just to think and just to think, right? I mean, he held a high ranking leadership position within the O, bro, and was very inf in, in, instrumental and influential at that time with some of the current leaders that you have today. You know what I'm saying? He was their big homie, which yeah. kind of makes it kind of ironic. You know I mean, he's the one that laced up a lot of these individuals, you know what I mean? From Tibbs to Pinky to Corny to yeah. Tex, you know what I mean? You know, he was around all these individuals back yeah, in the day. Sun, he was around yeah. Sundown, wasn't he? Yeah, so was Fig. All these guys, all these guys were, man. You know, and, and you know, back to this this whole topic, man, was just to show we were thinking about doing something new, bringing a little bit of life in. We figure that this is one of the key points in NS history that people don't talk about, man, because all this occurred around the same time period as when Cheyenne was hit. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. December of 1972, they killed Sharon and then they killed this individual. You know what I'm saying? After being on the bat end of the sticks for like the last year. Because of the building block of everything happened in 68, man. They had the war going on for years. They tried to have peace numerous times at that time. But this, these moments right here was when the, val the revenge, vows, and blood was, was stipulated. You know what I mean? There was going to be no truce. And I mean, I'm not going to have any doll hostilities or not. But these are the type of sacrifices that were made during this time time period to have the things that you have today. Regardless how some of these dudes fell off later on, decided to not, you know, be a part of the organization, drop out, whatever it may be, they got caught up in the in the split, the NF1, NF2. That's all irrelevant, man. For the existence of today and for what a lot of soldados have today behind the walls, doesn't come from what the sacrifices that happened in the 90s and 2000s. They came from the beginning, from these individuals in the 70s that took that stand when there was a cause when there was a struggle, you know what I'm saying? Which no longer exists. Things, times have changed, you know what I mean? But I don't think that these individuals, when they were making these sacrifices at that time, thought that things would be going in the direction that they are going today. I'll tell you what, if people were keeping score, man, and, and this is kind of, you know, a broad way to look at it, man, but you could say from 68 to 72, the, the NF may not have been on the winning side. I mean, don't get me wrong, they were handling their business, whatever. War is war, you can't win every individual battle. The tide kind of changes 72 on. You know, 72 on, man, the tables turn. You know what I'm saying? And, and there was a lot, 
you know, you might be able to say those four years were, were not the best. The next four years were. 72 was bad in the beginning, though. You had a couple people that were hit at that time, man. Like, you know what I mean? You had Bullwinkle, you had Diamond, you know what I mean? You had a couple, of the, you know, a couple of people that didn't die, but they got stabbed. Bruce Morgan, you know, the Randa brothers. All this stuff happened, man. But, you know, I mean, at that time, they had got, you know, Bobby Sabata. They had got Cheyenne, and they had got this Haley cat. You know what I mean? And there's other individuals like this Roth, and even Conejos, you know what I mean? From my understanding, Cornell caught his. I'm not going to speak too much of it because I don't know the facts, man, but from my understanding, Cornell's hit was on an, another Aryan Brotherhood that he caught out there in Sacramento. That if I'm not mistaken, I may be wrong on this, man, but I'm, somehow there was some type of relationship there. You know what I mean? If I'm not mistaken, it was either an AB associate or an AB member. I don't know the details. I'm going to look into that, but there's, for some reason, he's doing a life sentence, as we know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, um, yeah, everything pre like 72, I mean, 68 was a big year, the all out blitz. We know about that. You know I mean, there was a separation, but then there was a lot of peace, peace, peace talks going on at that, at that time. But I think with the numerous hits that were occurring in different prisons, when you're, when you're in peace talks, you don't hit your enemy. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I think at that point, <laughs> I don't know if the MA was just dragging them along. If most MA members were like, like I said, I've heard this from numerous people that it was people like Champ Renoso and other cats. And these individuals had way more influence than even Cheyenne. I think Cheyenne's iconic figure status comes a lot from American me, as well as how he was killed as well. And that he was trying to maintain peace. But as far as his Balabra within, the, within his organization, yeah, he was respected. He was in, in high regards. But I think from what I've been told from numerous people, that there was a lot more MA members that had a lot more influence. And you can even watch the Kilroy movie. You know what I mean? That, you know, our buddies at LA Times, uh, uh, you know, produced. They even show in that movie that Cheyenne's, Cheyenne's uh, uh, presence within the MA, yes, he was recognized, but there was already talks about him. So maybe he wasn't looked at as far as high as a leadership position. We've always been taught like he, that he was, but that's just what's coming in our teachings. You know what I'm saying? And so I think at this time period, this is where everything happened from that point, point period to where like, even in our history, we were always taught that <laughs> the reason why there would never be any trees, I mean, excuse me, trees, I always say that, my words get tongue twisted. Truce with the MA was because when we killed, when the NF killed Cheyenne, excuse me, they vows revenge in blood. You get what I'm saying? And that we've, that allegedly we've, we've hit three of their brass, we've hit none of ours. That's what I've been taught. I don't know. There's going to be different types of types of discussions on that. But that's what we've been been, been taught, man. And, and like I said, the historical standpoints of what happened, who was what, that's all irrelevant, man. But we can say during this time period from 1972 on is where the NF's growth started to emerge, where you started seeing changes. They were not, no longer going to just be dudes that were pushing a revolutionary cause behind the wall for the betterment of the pe people. They were now becoming guerreros. They were now becoming soldiers. They were now becoming more organized. They were now becoming more militant. Now they had a whole different structure, right? And this is, like I said, this is the key. This is the key time period is these dates right here. December of 1972 with these two deaths is what pushed the NF in the direction that you see today. Yeah, every time I look up something, man, I'm, I, I always reflect back to 72 by the amount of overall casualties. I mean, not pointing out one in particular group, be it, you know, down the way, the, the white dudes up north. Um, it's just the sheer amount of hits and murders, murders and hits both that occurred. And that, that one year, bro, was brutal. You know what I'm saying? Like, you look up a lot of murders, bro, every other thing, 72 this, 72 that, stabbing, 72 killing, murders, killing, 72. It, and in the beginning of the year, it was mostly all MA. It was mostly all MA and AB hitting the NF. I mean, that's just me being straight honest. Yeah. I think there was only one incident where it was different. I think it was when when uh, Bobby Sapata got hit. That's about it. You know. But of course, we're going to be told that he wasn't a member at that time. But I mean, I'm I'm only I'm only talking to three members that were pulled in 1970. So I guess they don't know nothing. Hey, man, what what year would you say, in your honest opinion, as we don't really know, would have been the last? major conflict on either side where somebody was hit it didn't creep into the 80s huh it did not creep into the 80s the only time it, it creeped into the 80s 
may have been on the corporate integrated yards. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think what they used to do at that time was because it was NFMA separation. When you had the emergence of Norteños and Sureños, you know what I mean? Like you had a mixture of people. They didn't have North or South at that time. So they started to put Southerners mixed with, with NF members, Northerners mixed with MA members. And there was a lot of disputes that happened over that because of the new alliances that started to form between the NF and North Daniels. You know, Sundown talks about it, you know, and, and, and Solid Dad, no way, Hobo and Tips and all of them got off on some Sudanios. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. As well as NF members that were actually from down south were getting off on the Sudanios. You know what I'm saying? Sundown said that they weren't ready for no real NF. So <clears throat> you would be housed in different tiers and going to different yards at that time. So those are the conflicts that you would experience it back then is from what I heard. You know, you'd be put on an NF tier or you'd be put on an MA tier. And I think that's how they were able to also recruit people from different sides from either down south or up north. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of these factions that were, you know I mean, recruited, you know, they played smart. Like Bobo had, had, had a vision, I was told, right? You know, to recruit these groups like the Chino centers and people from Santa Barbara and, and you know, Ontario and Oxnard and all these different areas, man, that actually had NF influence for them to run, run interference on MA activities. You know what I'm saying? So, but I think the changes started to happen when they started to finally separate them. You know what I mean? When the MA finally had alliances with the Sureños that were representing the Trece, and you know what I mean? Then you started having Northerners that aligned with the NF. I think that's when they started doing the separation in the 80s. Because back in the days, they used to have them on different tiers. The NF would be like, say they'd be in Quinton, you'd have someone on the second tier, then you'd have MA on the third tier. And they'd go to separate yards. You know what I'm saying? So they had a lot of split at that time. And before that, they even had them in separate prisons. You know what I mean? They had some in Tracy, they had some in Soledad, Chino. And back then, yes, they were slammed down from the rest of general population, but they still were able to walk around a little bit. It was kind of a trip. You're locked down and separated. All the shoe and ass sick stuff came later on down the line. You know what I mean? So there was a, a lot of different changes, man. And that's one time here that I want. I would like to get more information is <laughs> everything from 81 to 89. Yeah, the you 80s know, every, are kind of a blank spot. Everything, everything that happened that happened before they all got sent to Corcoran and to Hatchby Shoe. Because they were in different prisons at the time. They were in Solidad. Um, they were in DVI. Um, they were at different facilities. And then when they opened up the different shoe units at that time, it's when they actually really started to slam them down. So they were slammed down, but they were still out there taking care of business, walking around. They had access to the mainline a little bit, a little bit of wiggle action. You know, it's like being slammed down in like a pod with all NF members and they're popping your door every day and you're able to walk around and do your thing. It was kind of like that back in the days. And sometimes they would mix in other Northerners or Southerners and that's where the recruiting pool basically came from at that time because they were able to lace these guys up because the hole wasn't like the hole like you, like you have today. You know what I'm saying? They weren't escorting you out in handcuffs and all that shit. You were just being taken out going to the yard at the time, man, from my understanding. So this is where they started doing the recruiting basis, like places like Tracy and San Quentin to get these young Northerners and they started to lace them up. So I think around like the, the last casualties, man, would probably have to be within 72 to 74. You know what I'm saying? Hey, what, year, what year did they stop doing that damn uh, bullshit gladiator stuff in Corcoran? Do you remember what year they finally stopped that? Was it 93? Or 90, 93 or 94 or 95? One of those years, man. I think 94 maybe. Yeah, I don't think it made it all the way to 94. <laughs> I'm just but asking. Going because, out there. I mean, I'm just asking because, you know, besides, you know, you know, the bloody '70s and you know the, the the incidents in the '80s. As far as like, just straight up any kind of actual physical combat, that probably pretty much ended when the Corcoran was separated. Really. Yeah. You well, know? I mean, there's probably there's probably incidents that happened up in the bay, yeah. that we may not remember, where they were popping doors open, putting you out there on the tier, and I mean, you know. Where people got hit. Stabbed, I know the door here. policy was already into effect when I was there. In 96? I was there in 95 as well, but only for 30 days. And I was, I was like isolated, man. In my pod, there was nobody. There was MA and, and uh, 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 Defector and, and some white That's, boys. This is funny, right? Because, okay, when I went to uh, Corcoran Shoe, right? I, I got some stories about Corcoran. We'll go into that later on, right? But I was moved around. I was on a layover to the bay. So I went from different, I, I went to the 4A side, 
which was a regular shoe unit at, at that time, right? The 4B at that time only had two units that were validated blocks, 4B4 left and 4B4 right. Now, at, at, when I left and was still active, they had about five uh, blocks in Corcoran at that time. But when I was on the 4A yard in the shoe, it was mandatory green light that door pops open. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? In the regular shoe. The val when I got to the validated blocks, they had a whole different policy, man. It was, <clears throat> unless they put a green light, I said individual. I mean, I was there. We, The whole time I was in Corcoran, we had two green lights. One of them was on a Sureño, and that green light got taken because he ended up getting this individual named Angel Chavez, AC from uh, Vice. you probably know him from the Bay. Him and his dad were locked up there for a minute. He Angel was, he Chavez was where? From where? From, from Vice. Oh, from Visalia. He was doing a life for man. He, he was getting, he was recruited as a C at that time. Um, he was a unit commander and his family was a regiment commander, right? Silver. So they ended up giving a Sureño his fucking canteen. And the Sureño took it. I remember. And so they're, dial, they're dialoguing, right? With the Sureños. My neighbors, they're shot calling the block. He's a secretary for Jack, uh, Jack, uh, Jack Padilla, Jacko. And so they're communicating, bam, bam, because you know why? I'm the one sending all the communications. I'm, I'm the one next door to Shotgun. He's communicating with Jack, so all this communication is going back and forth. This individual elected, his excuse was this. I'm not going to give it back, or I'm not going to give you nothing or give it back because it, the cop messed up. So he was going to keep the canteen. So he not only took someone else's canteen, signed it, knew it wasn't for him after he already got his canteen, Right. Yeah. And so we put a green light on them. Now, about a day later, they uh, uh, they bring home with canteen. He wanted he's wanted 602 action. They, they lifted the green light. And I, but I was thinking in my head, like, fucking why lift the green light? The dude basically said, fuck you guys. Just because he got his canteen. You know what I'm saying? You know, the other green light that we had there was on a BGF member, believe it or not. We acknowledged all the other BGF members. <laughs> Before, last time, when I was there the first time, we were cool. There was a cat, Yarrow. He was an A-pod. He would do the roll call every morning, and he was solid. This time when I got back, there was a lot of tension. The reason be it was because this one Africano is a BGF member, disrespected a Carnal Chilo. Therefore, over some magazines, and stuff, over some BS, over some magazines. So because of that, we had a green light on, on, that, on that BGF member. We would talk to all the other ones, but the BGF would not sign our 602s. Any group 602s, we had a group 602s with the AB, the MA, Sudanios, and everything to try to bring different conditions to the shoe. The BGF said they would not sign any of our 602s until we acknowledged them. So we had a little conflict with the BGF when I was there in 4B4 left, man. And it was all over just fuck. It was because he disrespected Chilo. Goes you know down like that. So we're, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know Chilo. Hey, I had a lot of love for Chilo and everything, man. So, but I know Chilo. Chilo, you know what I mean? Could be a certain way sometimes, man. But it was, you know, a little conflict there. But, but back to my point in the shoot. This was the whole thing philosophy that we had. Unless you plan to take out an MA member or AB and had the means to do it and were willing to take their life, you were to stand down. Unless that green light was implemented, then you had to get off. Other than that, stand down. Hey, in Pelican Bay, the rule was, and granted, you know who I was in there with. Um, the rule was, if they pop another door, you stop immediately where you are. Come as, outside, stand your ground. As, as, assume a defensive stance. I mean, you're not going to be out there like this, but just sit there like this. You know what I mean? Or put your hands behind your back, you know, like you're just chilling. Just chill. If yeah. they rush you, you got to handle your business. It happened to me one time with, with two MA bottles. It happened to me too, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean, a couple they, times they just went like this to me and went right back, kept their backs to me, riding on the bottom bunk. They're both riding. They turned around when their door opened. They went like this, you know, like went right back to riding. I was just check, standing check, there. Check out this policy that we had. Things changed, bro. We had a policy that anybody that was not active, whether they were northern, or southern, or white boy, we had to engage. I think that was the case in Pelican Bay as well. Was it? Yeah. Because you would think that's not your politics. It's not your business. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I know for sure if it was if, if it was one of our own, yes. Oh, yeah, of course. And I think at first, bro, to be to be quite frank, the AB wasn't part of the door policy in Pelican Bay. 
they had to be engaged still. Yeah. So I think, they were always, I think, I think that was always... amended afterwards, but when I was there at first, the the MA and the in the Serenos, they were off limits unless they attacked you. You know, obviously we ain't messing with the brothers or the Paisas or nobody like that. But I think it was still all bad with A B for at least for a while. So they were already planning seats for us to get off on inactives of other groups. You know what I'm saying? So if, if it was a Sudeño that was in no good standings, they had a, they were communicating with each other, telling each other if they were solid or not. It was it was weird. That doesn't I make sense like, to me because it doesn't make sense to sacrifice your own manpower for somebody else's trash. I, I didn't understand it, right? Like when a new arrival would come, they would communicate with each other to let people know if they were good or not. And then you'd hear, okay, gracias. And then they started acknowledging the person. I was like, what the fuck, man? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I could see not not talking to them or doing business with them or even acknowledging them, but as far as wasting your own manpower for somebody else's trash, that's weird to me, but... I, hey, bro, the first time I was there, bro, the first time I was there, I was on walk alone, bro, when they still had group yard for a minute because of, like, my violent nature. The Garnales there, they employed me as a spy, bro, to go to the yards and act like I wasn't active with, with anything and try to get information from me in the dropouts because they would be in, in the in the pods next to me. You know what I'm saying? Oh, while you were on walk alone. Yeah. When I was you. on walk alone, bro, they said, play it off like you're not active and shit yeah. because I was in the last cell, right, in APOD. And then you had you had uh, uh, Chilo and Joker, G Chilo from Saho, and you had Joker from fucking Castroville and this right over here. And then to my right in the pot over, two, three cells, you had Carlitos and Wino from Oakland. Carlitos from Saho and Wino from Oakland. And then you had a couple a couple dudes that were, that were uh, uh, downstairs that were dropouts in the first three pots. So when they used to put, they, we didn't have cages back then. We'd go to the main big yard. And so what you would do was there would be a diamond shape. You know what I'm saying? And what you do is you could talk through the crack. You know what I mean, what's cracking? Whoa, whoa, whoa. So I'd go over there and I'd try to get different information. I would try to play things out. I'd, I'd, I'd give out false information, <laughs> this and that. You know what I mean? Things I was staged to do. And I'd come in with reports, man, about, what these guys were saying or what they were doing or what their motives were. And yeah, you know I mean, without, it was kind of, a, uh, but you know, it's just weird because I've been in, in, in different places to where I've been places where we could do business with them. We could sell to the dropouts and I've been places where we're told we can't even talk to them. So it, it just depends upon which sees there, which direction he wants to go. Because I went there years later, you know, when silver and them were there and I was told that we could not acknowledge any of them. You know, so here you are. They try to acknowledge you and talk to you, bro. And then you'd have to fucking ignore them like this and shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know? Hey, that, that's what I try to tell people, man, when we talk about our experience, my experience and yours. We could have been sellies for a, some point in time. Everybody's experience is going to be different. It all depends. It could change from pod to pod, block to block, unit to unit, building to building, facility to facility, prison to prison, state to feds. Everything is different depending on where you are. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a general expectation, general guidelines, rules, regulations, but they are subject to be implemented depending on how the authority in charge wishes it to be, you know, and anybody functioning under that dude, they're not supposed to be answerable to functioning along those lines because that's the authority in charge who dictated that. You follow instructions. You're in the clear. You just need to, if anything ever happens, you go somewhere, you go to the hole get at the right person and you say hey i didn't agree with this i was strictly following orders you're good so everybody's that doesn't matter everybody's experience is different and today's lesson is you don't got to worry about getting killed in prison you don't got to worry about indeterminate shoes and rico wax if you get out there you get a job you take care of your family go to school get educated and just try to follow laws if not there's consequences sometimes they're deadly Yep. It's your boy Rojo, Big Flacco. We're running a little late today, man. We'll get this video out about 2.30. Usually it's 2 o'clock. We apologize, but we give you a good one. Nice, solid half hour. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll holler at you later on live. Flacco's talking about doing a marathon tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I'm waiting, looking forward to it.